This is part three of interview one, DevOps with Kai Jang. This is the interview section. Welcome to the interview section. So Kai Jang is our guest today. He's a DevOps engineer and we're, we're just going to have a brief dialogue about the, the DevOps role, um, ask him about some of the motivations on why he decided to move in into the role. So he had described, you had described earlier, Kai, that you were a test engineer and test manager for around 10 years or more. Um, and you touched on, you know, an overview of your career. So just wondering, why did you decide to go into DevOps? Why were, yeah, what was attractive about it in, for you to make that move? Uh, sure. Um, I guess I am, I kind of fell into DevOps by accident, um, to, to be completely honest. I transitioned, I, so I was in the testing space for quite a number of years. Um, and as I said, one of the, uh, main things that was part of my responsibility was maintaining the test environment. So we actually had our own servers, our databases, um, and, you know, our libraries of code um, for automation. So we have to make sure all of that works when we need it to work. Um, that exposed me to basically the infrastructure side of, uh, of uh, I guess, the technical role. Um, but as it turns out, maintaining a database in a non-production environment for a test environment is actually not quite dissimilar to maintaining a database in a productionized environment. Can you because say, at can the end of the day, the technology... Slow down. Can you say that again? That was a bit quick for me. Yeah. So maintaining a database or a virtual machine in a non-production test environment... Yep is actually not that dissimilar to uh, maintaining a database or a virtual machine in a productionized environment. The actual technical problems are quite similar. Um, there are some, obviously production being uh, the, I guess the importance and the certain restrictions around production, those are a bit different, but ultimately you're trying to make sure a piece of infrastructure works as intended and when there are issues you debug and fix those problems and I guess that's how I got into the support space um, which uh, I think you know when I transitioned into it benefited from the knowledge that I had um, diagnosing and uh, fixing issues in the uh, in the uh, test environments uh, once you get into those spaces, what you start to see is that the problems uh, that arise seem to fall in certain categories and they tend to repeat. So let's say a good example would be, let's say a certain process or your, a certain virtual machine runs out of memory or a database needs re-indexing because you know, the data's grown by so much. Well, if the answer is you need to run a command on top of the thing, then the next natural step of that is you automate that process because you don't really want to whip out your command or try and remember the command and then run it um, and then check that it worked. You can actually get uh, basically a robot to do that for you. Yeah, you want to automate and that, all those steps yeah. that you need to get into prod. Yeah. So the I guess the exciting part of being in support and and you know, I guess more uh, contemporaneously in DevOps is figuring is problem solving, is figuring out there is a particular problem. Um, what technology can I use? What tools can I use? What process can I use to 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 get through this problem? But once you figured it out, is automating it so you don't actually need to do it again by hand. Right. Um, so that I guess is the nature of the two sides of DevOps. Um, Ops is all about building and maintaining uh, application and, you know, probably more 
focused on the infrastructure side, but certainly the application side as well. Um, and the dev part is the automation of uh, known issues and tasks uh, to basically give you the agility and also the consistency because, for example, if, I can, if I'm maintaining a database and I run a command to re-index the database uh, and I write some instructions and the next person comes along, they might not be familiar with my instructions and in the process of copying and pasting my instruction, they might accidentally run it against the wrong database and, and you know, issue the command slightly incorrectly. So when you automate that process, you remove those those levels of human right. error. It's, it's, it's yeah, it, there's a strong case for going in the direction of automation. I was just <clears throat> going to comment on a um, couple of things. The, like there's a, kind of broad um, area in, in domain knowledge that you need. So ops and the dev, um, I guess that, that kind of makes it interesting because you're not specializing as much. Um, I seem to recall maybe sys admins were like sort of a role where people might've transitioned into DevOps. Um, the other thing that I was going to ask was because that's a good chunk of time that you spent doing the testing and, and what you're describing. Was there like a evolution where you started, you know, started to see with that automation, it became, it turned into DevOps. It was just start creeping into your work. It became, the nature of work just became that and the title hadn't formalized, but it was kind of happening anyway. Uh, so I would say DevOps as a title is a more recent phenomenon, but certainly... Um, in the sysadmin space, you know, going back decades, people would have had scripts that they would have written to do repetitive things. Um, so, I mean, the CICD really um, started in the developer space because uh, once upon a time, people were literally doing builds of software on their own computers and then uploading those output to a another place and I'm guessing they were sick of just sitting there or having the computer being taken up by the build process so they've offloaded it to a server and then once you offload it to a server you must automate it because you're not going to be sitting there running it by hand yourself right. um, so there is it's the actual work is not a new uh, phenomenon but I think the title is but I think in the modern paradigm of DevOps, there has certainly been a proliferation of tools and practices that are more standardized and more well widely accepted. And I think one of the one of the reasons for that is it's it's quite accepted nowadays that um, without practicing some of those core tenets of DevOps, you're not going to get the, I guess, the level of agility that that IT companies or IT teams require to be able to adapt and move at the speed that that's required these days. Right. It's a, it's a recognition of its importance to delivering and delivering fast. And then if you're going to claim to be CICD doing things like, I think <laughs> Facebook, they're claiming you can just, you know, push things into prod really quick, then it, it, it kind of entails that you need to give due respect to DevOps or to the role. Do you think that's fair? Yeah, I, yeah, I would say that, 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 um, certainly I, you know, never worked in Facebook, so I don't actually know what their processes are. Uh, there are things that every company can push to prod multiple times a day with very little consequence. Uh, and there are things that every company, I call them dirty little secrets, uh, have that, I would hazard a guess if they push to if they push too cavalierly would cause catastrophic impacts to the stability of their platform. So I, I think I think one of the things is without a bit more context as to what a company is releasing to production at you know a breakneck frequency, it's it's um, it's quite difficult to gauge the benefits and the validity of of, of those. Um, of those 
uh, claims. Yeah, I think- so I'm sure I'm sure Facebook pushes to production every day, but maybe they're not doing that to their core backbone or you know. Yeah, no, of course. Yeah, I think you know that yeah. they've been around quite a while, so they're probably pretty. <laughs> they're different as a mature company relative to when they were starting out. I just remember they had a motto of kind of like break things or break fast. Know, some, break fast. No, run fast and break things. But that was probably when it was ten people in Zuckerberg. I don't know. It might have been for a few years. Where, yeah. <laughs> speculating um but no no that that's really good so i think the other question that that i had for you was um i guess you've given us a showcase and that provided a, a good representation of what a workflow is like you run into problems you're trying to automate automate things but um yeah i think earlier in the week you're saying you're getting pretty busy so on the nature of the role, what is it like? What's a typical day? Um, you know, maybe describe that a little bit for people that might be interested in this kind of role. Yeah. Um, it's, it's quite, I think DevOps as a, as a discipline itself is quite broad. Um, it actually breaks into a number of sub disciplines. Um, one of the area, key areas of DevOps is obviously CICD. Um, so if I just talk about that particular area, um, you know, in, in, in the types of work that I would do, uh, for example, I would go into a work and be told that we need to push out a new service or a new product um, in, let's say, two or three weeks' time. Uh and, you know, I would then work with the developers to understand what the what kind of um, uh, technology it uses, whether it's JavaScript or .NET or Java. Can you give a little and, um, um, comment on, on, you know, what kind of products your company does your and what your company... Um, is it, it's not a consultancy, right? No, so I, at the moment I work for a product company called Nintex and they build basically... Uh, um, workflow automation software. So they essentially have a cloud platform that allows people to uh, sign up for an account or a tenancy, as we call it, um, create workflows, uh, but essentially in a, in a kind of a GUI interface uh, by dragging in actions and then link those workflows up, but also at the back end, can dictate what actions to take at each of those steps in the workflow and have it have it automatically processed. So an example would be a contract uh, workflow where let's say uh, the initiation of the contract will require uh, someone to fill out a template, then submit for review, then submit for approval. So things like um, you know retrieving the template, presenting the template, uh, sending an email to the person who needs to review it, uh, requesting approval, uh, requesting signing, endorsement, those kinds of things. They can also all be, I guess, created in a, in a um, workflow format and executed. Uh, you know, traditionally, these kinds of things will be done by, a, by hand in an organization, and I know many organizations these days still do. Right. So that's, that's the software that they, they create. But when you're building out a solution, is that generic or like customer-specific in what you're describing there? Um, we're talking less about DevOps, just FYI. Um, it's just the, in context, you know, yeah. We run, yeah, we run a microservices architecture, just like any modern company. Um, and uh, the solutions are, you know, ours is product feature-based, basically. It's not specific to a certain customer. Yeah, you customer. do it, it's not like you do it once company. and many customers can, can reuse that workflow Correct. that you're yeah. describing yeah. yep cool no no it just helps with yeah. when you were saying you know you go to work there's a new feature product and um where your work fits in so we're we're not a slight tangent but hopefully it helps with um context yeah so you know I, i'd be told uh that uh you know we're, we're going to be delivering a certain microservice to production in let's say three weeks time and i'll work with the developers to um obviously they've been working on the code for a little while now, and they most likely can build and test the code locally on their own PCs. And I would then 
uh, trans understand that build process, translate that into a pipeline in uh, you know a CS CI/CD tool, um, and so that's pretty much step one. And and you know that that pipeline will build the artifact, test the artifact by running unit tests, and then publish the artifact to an artifact store. And then I would work with them to create the build, uh, the release pipeline. So the deployment part where it takes that artifact and deploys it to a particular target location. Um, in our case, we use Azure, Microsoft Azure for hosting our services. So, uh, you know, the, the release process uh, would involve also spinning up the infrastructure itself, right? So these days we actually automate the creation of the uh, infrastructure by, you know, by templating out the, uh, writing in code the, the pieces of infrastructure we actually need to create. Um, and we often have to do it for multiple environments. Uh, so that all gets baked into the release pipeline as well as the deployment of the code and any post-deployment tests. Um, there's a number of other things that are kind of related to that around security, uh, networking, uh, you know, those kinds of non-functional considerations must be taken into account. Yeah, and you would reach out to people for help with that, would you? In some instances, yes. In some instances, no. It just depends on um, uh, whether my experience covers those particular areas or not. I, I guess one of the one of the things about the operations area and, and DevOps is it's one of the attractive things about it is it's quite broad. Um, there are certainly practitioners who are very focused in one specific set of technology or one specific set of processes. But in general, I think most DevOps practitioners are, uh, I wouldn't say generalists, um, but I think they have to be across a number of uh, infrastructure areas at the very least, right? So, uh, you know, storage, networking, uh, compute like virtual machines. Um, increasingly in the in the cloud, you've got things like uh, platform as a service, uh, you know, uh, containerization. So they're all kind of pieces, and you know, also things like um, uh, DNS, like internet routing, uh, CDN and caches, and those kinds of things. So you kind of have to be a little bit across everything. So if you if your knowledge kind of provides sufficient cover for these kinds of things, then um, you can probably do it yourself. If not, you could um, go on and do some Googling and do some self-education yeah. or consult someone who's a bit more knowledgeable. But it's a good role for um, getting exposure to these different areas if, if you wanted to uh, learn learn those things and work on, I guess, varied problems, uh, accumulate different knowledge. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, one, one of the nice things is you get to interact with, you know, literally the, the product, the people who kind of, you know, uh, come up with the idea of the features to developers as they're developing to the testers as they're implementing the automated tests all the way into production. It is, um, I guess, in my mind, one of the true end-to-end -end roles. Um, there's no, there's no real uh, concept of like you know throwing it over the fence because literally we're we're. We are the people at the end of the fence. You're like the glue, uh, right? You're the glue back. that connects the different fences. <laughs> Sometimes. Well, I like I like to think I like to think in a in a in a in an initiative, every team member is a is some form of glue. But I think we we certainly um, interface with every every step of the process. Yeah. So, but yeah. when when you say end to end, it's more like you will be involved at any point from the end to end, um, you know, life cycle of a project, but you're not necessarily involved from start to finish. It's just you'll come in at different points when needed. And then it could mean that you're working on projects concurrently, solving different parts yep. of their yep. cycles. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We can certainly be involved from start to finish. I mean, there's a, there is a large component of infrastructure design. Uh, so when you are planning to create a new, you know, um, I guess, service, uh, there are some certain decisions to be made about where do you put that service 
what are the pros and cons of, let's say, putting it on on premises versus putting it on cloud, or putting it on uh, a PaaS uh, resource versus putting on Kubernetes. So, so we do get involved in some of those decisions and um, conversations. Yeah, no, it uh, sounds like a interesting role for people that want want to um, get into different areas. I guess th th this leads into naturally leads into another question on. Um, you know, I think you'd mentioned in the past, it's difficult to hire for a DevOps role. And I guess what kind of skills do you need? What kind of person is suited to doing that kind of work? Uh, it's very hard to say what kind of person is suited for that kind of work. Um, some of the key skills, uh, it's, it, I guess there's, there's, it's a bit of a cliche statement at this stage, but it's also very true, is DevOps is more about the culture than it is about the tools. You, you'll see a lot of, um, a lot of uh, I guess, blogs or resources online talking about how to use a particular tool to do DevOps, to, to solve a particular DevOps problem. But actually, the, the, I guess the most important thing about um uh, a good DevOps engineer is actually the two most important thing in my mind is literally communication and problem solving. So communication is important because going back to being, um, uh, you know, interfacing with every every step of a you know a product or software development process means you you have to be able to talk to different stakeholders, but also in my mind, ask the correct questions to be able to assist them in making the correct infrastructure choices or the correct CICD choices. Um, it's not necessarily always something that is always front, you know, front and center of mind for the core team that's developing the product because that you know, obviously, rightly so, their priority will be the actual feature and the you know the um, the uh, the core attributes of the feature. Uh, but what's very important is supporting those features is the platform. And if you make certain platform decisions incorrectly, you could actually end up um, uh, uh, significantly um, disadvantaging the, 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 the final product. So being able to tease out the actual non-functional requirements of a particular product um, by asking the right questions um, and and also providing the right level of information is quite important. And obviously problem solving. So once you have a particular uh, CICD problem or a, it, you know, in, in some in instances, a production problem that you need to solve, you need to be able to think holistically about what are the inputs, what are all the integration points um, and what are the tools available and what potentially are the tools that are available that you don't know or the processes are available and, and go looking for the right, right I guess, right hammer for the, for the job. Right. Um, additionally, I would say um, one of the challenges of being in DevOps is because the discipline has quite a broad footprint in terms of infrastructure, tools, and processes, uh, it does help if someone... Uh, you know, uh, has uh, has the ability to pick up and uh, use and understand the purpose of new technologies and tools quite quickly. Um, at the same time, uh, the best DevOps are also, when they are picking up a new piece of tool, they're also thinking about how that tool's new adoption in production uh the impact of that on the rest of the, you know, the platform, as well as a lot of the non-functional requirements like resiliency, security, uh, uh, you know, performance and those kinds of things. So uh, it does also require, um, I guess, uh, a, a little bit of a detail focus. Um, so 
yeah, that's I would say the the, the core kind of demands of a, of a of a good DevOps engineer. Yeah, no, that's helpful. I think um, the, I think that, that details one is <clears throat> seems a bit more apparent, but the problem solving um, and communication they seem pretty critical. It is probably common to a lot of other roles, but very hard to demonstrate like in an interview or just stating that you know something probably it's probably the sort of work where it has to be demonstrated through a track record or experience in a sense um i think i think there was some resemblance to maintaining systems as well um as being transferable if, if you'd done work like that in the past is that close um hopefully not not inaccurate uh yeah look i think i think going back to the original question of why it's kind of difficult to hire um for devops roles is i should say there are you know it's one devops is a quite a um popular or contemporary role for people to pursue so uh, there are varying degrees of experience for candidates out there. Uh, uh, you know, you've got people who have decades of experience who are working in the DevOps space to people who, you know, literally just picked up some online tutorials, built some of their own uh, kit and, and have experience in that part. So it's, uh, but also from a, from a needs point of view, every organization is slightly different. Um, a, uh, a very traditional organization has traditional processes and require a kind of uh, contextual thinking for that particular organization, which might make it, you know, not suitable for someone who's w- used to working in a startup environment and vice versa. Um, but also the, you know, every company that you go to, the, uh, I guess the fundamental things that you do will be the same, but the way that they do it will be different. And so um, it, it does require quite, a, you know, someone with a, with a reasonable amount of experience, but also um, have extracted from their experience a, a set of four core skills that make them adaptable. Right. I think that's what, what's difficult. Yeah. yeah, and and what what you said about the the culture fit is is also a, like another requirement that make, can make it more complicated. Well, yeah. I, I think that, you know that information that you've provided through your experience has been really helpful, um, even for someone who's not working in DevOps like me, but is um, has exposure to it, and it, you know it can benefit my work as well. Really appreciate you um, taking the time to explain some of that. Um, yeah, hope, hope hope you enjoyed it as well. Yeah, it's, it's a pleasure talking to you too. Great. Well, that's that's it for the interview. Um, look forward to catching you in the next one. This concludes part three of interview one, DevOps with Kai Jang. Links to part one and part two can be found in the description below. Thanks for watching.